Welcome everyone to a live Q&A session produced by the Jewish Community Center of Greater Buffalo. And my name is Gon Erez, I'm a native Israeli, as you can hear the accent. I'm an IDF Lieutenant in Reserve and current the Chief Program Officer of the JCC. Part of my service in the spokesperson unit in the IDF, I was dealing with human rights organizations, so me and Bassem have some important uh, some uh, connection, professional connection. So uh, today our main discussion involves the current situation in Gaza in the aftermath of the ceasefire. Uh, as Jim mentioned, we have gathered many questions beforehand uh, from uh, the viewers, but uh, you can feel free to type your questions in the chat and we will try to address them time permitting. Uh, we have lots of them and little time. We will try to finish up uh, before uh, one o'clock. Uh, we have over, uh, you know, we have almost 100 people, if not more, joining us uh, from many places in the world. Um, from Israel, from New York City, the Ukraine, from Canada, Florida, LA, Ohio, obviously from Buffalo. And I also have uh, one friend from Gaza that's uh, joining us. And um, today's event is co-sponsored by Congregation uh, Beth El, uh, Beit Abraham, Kehilat Ortzion, and the Center for Jewish Life in Buffalo, and also uh, the Buffalo Jewish Federation. So let's get to it. I'd like to welcome Bassam Eid, native Palestinian, Jerusalem-based political analysis, human rights pioneer, and expert commentator in Arab and Palestinian affairs. Thank you for joining us, Bassem. How are you? Thank you. Thank you very much, Gon. Uh, how has the last the past two weeks have been for you? You live in uh, Jerusalem, in uh, East Jerusalem. Uh, how was your, you know, how was it for you? You know, I I think that it was the most horrible days that I noticed in my life since I born, you know, in 1958 until uh, uh, these days. Uh, and it was a huge storm of violence that nobody can understand it at all. For which reason this huge storm of violence came out? What is the purpose? of that storm of violence and what are the violent people want to achieve here? So it's just much more questions rather than answers. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the earth was, was flaming here in Jerusalem and unfortunately mainly in the, in the mixed cities inside Israel, like Akko, Haifa, Lud, Dramli, and, uh, and Yafo. And I used to say that if there is any achievement or any successes of the Hamas on this round, I think that what they achieved, only one thing, that they succeed to destroy the coexistence between the Jewish people and the Israeli Arabs inside Israel. And we know very well, when Haniya stood up in Qatar and he mentioned that and he highlighted that, that what Israel built in the past 73 years for coexistence with the Israeli Arabs we almost destroy it in the first 24 hours. And unfortunately, this is what's happening right now. Now, the question is, where are the Israeli Arab leaders? Where are the Israeli Arab religious leaders? Where are the Israeli Arab members of Knesset? Everybody disappeared and looks like that every leader became so scared to stand up and to call for calmness or for quiet. And that gave those thugs and gangsters that I call them, because we are talking about a couple of hundreds. We are not talking about hundreds of thousands. We saw the demonstrations inside Israel. We saw the violence inside Israel. Just a couple of hundreds who are criminals, by the way, their background is criminals. 
And these people use that opportunity to, uh, 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 to cause damage rather than anything else because they want to cause damage because they are so violent people. So I hope that uh, right now things looks like to me that it is calming down since the ceasefire uh, between Israel and the Hamas took place. I believe that everybody start rethinking what's really happened and why I harassed my neighbor for which purpose I harassed my neighbor. And I think that Jewish people, Muslims and Christians should have to ask God forgiveness for the harness that our hands caused to our friends, to our neighbors and to our fellowship. Thank you, Basim. I think I can agree a lot about it, about uh, Hamas's greatest success of implanting yeah. a hate between the people. And let me tell you, it's not just between Arabs and Jews in Israel, it's also between Jews and Jews, uh, right. left wing, wing and right wing. Um, right. They have, yeah, they've gained a huge success. Unfortunately, you know, their success is right. not military one, but probably diplomatic. And as you mentioned, so before we go any further, um, I'm sure not everyone knows you as well as I am, as I do. So please uh, introduce yourself shortly who you are, where you're from, uh, you know, what brought you here this afternoon with us or your evening? Yeah. Uh, I am a Palestinian. I born in the old city in a neighborhood called the Jewish Quarter, by the way. I grown up in the Jewish Quarter something like eight years. And in, in June 1966, the Jordanian government decided to evacuate 500 families from the Jewish quarter to North Jerusalem in a place called Shafat refugee camp. So I grown up and developed in a refugee camp for 33 years, from 66 till 1999, only after 1999, I bought a house after, uh, out of the Shafat refugee camp and where I am based right now. Uh, I am a human rights uh, activist. I started my human rights career with an Israeli organization called B'Tselem. I worked for B'Tselem for seven and a half hour, uh, years. I used to search uh, violations of human rights uh, from the Israeli army against Palestinians from Rafah in the south, in the, in the south, till Jenin in the north. I was the only field worker in B'Tselem in that time. And uh, uh, after the Oslo agreement in 1994, I noticed that beside the violations of human rights, which is committed by the Palestinian Authority, still the Palestinian human rights organizations focusing on Israel and no one want to talk about the violations committed by the Palestinian Authority. So in 1996, I decided to resign from B'Tselem to create a Palestinian organization called the Palestinian Human Rights Monitoring Group, documenting and controlling the violations committed by the Palestinian Authority. Just two months after I founded the organization, I was arrested by Yasser Arafat, by the way. But I was so lucky that I kept in the Palestinian jail in Ramallah only for 25 hours. The one who involved in my release directly was the former US Secretary Warren Christopher under the Bill Clinton administration. You know, Bill Clinton used to have a very strong relationship with Yasser Arafat, and that's probably benefited me. So since I was released in 96, that detention by the Palestinian Authority almost gave me a kind of impunity. You know, I lived in Jericho for 12 years, as an example, and I don't remember that anyone tried to approach my house or to knock on my door because of what I am talking about the Palestinian Authority. So that's 
in brief, let's say the, the 30 years that I spent it in defending the rights of the Palestinians under the Israelis and under the Palestinian Authority. Thank you. So if you can mention like one incident that was a life changing that led to your transition between from being, you know, working for B'Tselem and trying to advocate against the Israeli government and military to advocating against the Palestinian Authority. Was there like one incident that you remember like that made it? See, I am, first of all, I am a non-political person. I never ever been affiliated with any Palestinian political party. So when I am talking about human rights, I am talking about a pure human rights without politicizing these human rights. I start defending the Palestinians from the Israelis and I continue defending the Palestinians from their own leadership. Now, what makes me, let's say, more angry on the Palestinian Authority rather than the Israelis, we used in B'Tselem to write letters to different ministries that they were involved in violations of human rights. And a lot of investigation committees has been established by Israel to investigate violations of human rights that B'Tselem pointed out in that time. Unfortunately, under the Palestinian Authority, nobody is scared about the a human rights issue. When you write a letter to the police, you will never ever get an answer. Don't forget that under the Palestinian Authority, there used to be 15 different security forces. In Israel, you have the police and you have the army, only two that you can deal with them. Under the Palestinian Authority, there was 15 different security forces. And sometimes you don't know is such violation by which security force it has been committed. And that's, you know, gave me, let's say more energy, more energy to fight towards the human rights issue under the Palestinian Authority rather than I did under the Israelis. Well, it sounds all familiar to me. As I told you, I was working with B'Tselem a lot, like other Israeli and international organizations. And right. one thing I can say that, you know, as much as I'm critical of their actions and the way their agenda, uh, I can say about the Israel and the IDF that every uh, every claim, any inc every inquiry is being investigated. On right. the Israeli side, right. and that also reminds me, Judge uh, Goldstone, that if you remember Goldstone, a uh, United Nations report about Operation Cast Lead. From yes, yes, I remember. And his second uh, report that said that Israel has done tremendous work to investigate the accusations versus right. Hamas that has done nothing. Right, 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 right. All right, thank you. Um, so I will be um, juggling between um, questions from the audience and questions I came up with myself. And this one yes. is United. Um, Sheldon from Buffalo asks about the latest around uh, escalation of violence in Gaza. Uh, his question is about the incident in the mosque of when the Israeli police uh, or soldiers cut off the speakers in, uh, I think, a Laksa mosque. Uh, it was that one of the inflammatory actions, one of the things that sparked the violence. And a bigger and broader uh, question to you. In this last escalation of violence, how much do you think it started because of Israel's provocative actions in Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem and other uh, places? Or, and how much of that actually comes from Hamas or Iran interests? Yeah, unfortunately, I must have to point out uh, here a very important uh, issue that the whole issue of Jerusalem and the violence in Jerusalem started as a kind of a competition between the Hamas and Fatah, who is going to defend Jerusalem, who is going to protect Al-Aqsa, and who is able to incite the people in Jerusalem against the Israelis. It was a kind of a competition here. 
That's one of the major problems. Sheikh Jarrah is not related to that wave of violence at all. Sheikh Jarrah issue is a legal issue, which is almost on the table of the Supreme Court right now. And the Supreme Court is going to discuss this issue. So it is completely out of the picture. But the Hamas and the Fatah is trying to use the Sheikh Jarrah issue by claiming that what Israel is doing is an ethic cleanings against the Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah. And that's inside the people more and more. But in the meantime, I am wondering why people inside Al-Aqsa Mosque is a place for pray, is a place for pray. It's not a place to fight. It's not a place to throw stones. It's not a place that you have to, 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 uh, 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 to make your own propaganda on that. Why the religious leaders are not trying to be involved on what's really taking place inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque? Why? Are they afraid from the people? I think that God said that while you enter a religious place, you should have to respect it. Respected means not to make any kind of propaganda. But unfortunately, there are so many people who are very interesting to practice violence against the Israelis. And those people who succeed in the meantime to incite is such kind of hundreds of thousands inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque against the Israelis. But at the end, it is a political issue that the Hamas and the Fatah are trying to climb on it. Thank you. Um, there's a question from uh, actually someone from the Gaza city, uh, Rami, who is my friend. Um, according, you know, despite your answer, which I accept, still many people in Israeli politics claim that this provocation, one person, if there's one person to benefit in the Israeli side from all of this, might be uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, because he was just about to lose his government and this, you know, everything just threw off uh, with this situation. What do you think about that? Do you think Netanyahu had anything to do with that? You know, when people used to ask me about Netanyahu, I used to say, that I wish to see one Palestinian leader like Netanyahu. I think that Netanyahu is a person who almost did a lot to his country and to his people, which we couldn't see is such leader, by the way, in any other Arab country. We can see the Arab leaders, how they are corrupting their own people and they are covering themselves under the umbrella that we are going to liberate the Palestinians from the Israeli occupation. These are the Arab leaders. On the other side, of course, that there are some political people who might claim that because Netanyahu is going to lose his chair, he escalates the, these, this fight with the, with the Hamas. But on the other side, everybody knows that on the 12th of May, while the Israelis celebrating Yom Jerusalem, the Hamas shot six rockets towards Jerusalem. Why the Hamas did it? Do the Hamas want to show the Palestinians that they are the only protectors of Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa? Any country around the world will be shot by rockets, it will react. It will react, no doubt about that. And I think that that was the biggest mistake of the Hamas by shooting the six rockets towards Jerusalem. And this is how the Hamas right now almost paid the highest price 
in their life in the Gaza Strip. Gaza Strip today is completely destroyed. When I look to the pictures in Gaza today, I remember the pictures in Syria in the past 11 years, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's one of the major problems that the Hamas, in my opinion, cause for themselves and they cause for the other two innocent million Palestinians who are living in the Gaza Strip. Thank you. So on that note, you might have addressed it a little bit, but what do you think Hamas wants, wanted from this escalation? And do you think they achieved uh, their goals? See, the Hamas, the Hamas goals uh, uh, are very clear. The Hamas uh, uh, don't want Israel to be on the map. The main mission of the Hamas right now is how to destroy Israel. Hamas is not fighting Israel. Hamas want to, de to destroy Israel. Hamas want to trash Israel from the map. And that means that the Hamas much more representing the Iranian agenda rather than they are representing the Palestinian agenda. To trash Israel, this is not the agenda of the Palestinians. I think everybody is aware that in September 1993, there is what we call it the Oslo Accord between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And the accord was between the state of Israel and the PLO, which means it's a very clear recognition from the PLO on the existing of the state of Israel, which is completely different from the Hamas. So this is why the Hamas trying to escalate. We already heard, you know, after the ceasefire, some official Iranians talking how much money they used to spend every month in the Gaza Strip for the military capability of the Hamas. We hear them on the TV. A lot of millions of dollars. Qatar used to transfer over than $30 million a month. What the Hamas really did in the Gaza Strip since the Hamas took over the Gaza Strip in 2007, they didn't build a school over there. They didn't build a clinic over there. They didn't build university over there. They are just using all that money for their own military capability and for digging tunnels in terms to protect themselves and to hide themselves in a such specific time when Gaza has been hit by rockets by the Israelis. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, I have a question both from uh, Brenda here and also from Tova from Buffalo that she has ahead of time. Um, about the situation inside Israel uh, with a court, you know, after in the aftermath of this uh, escalation in Gaza. So uh, now that things are starting to calm down, as we see, you know, the ceasefire, uh, God willingly, is holding, uh, how does the average Israeli Arab feel about their neighbors in the mixed cities like Akko and Lud? And is there hope for a reconciliation? See, first of all, we must have to say that the majority of the Israeli Arabs were totally against such wave of violence inside Israel. We already saw during the demonstrations, couple of hundreds of people. We didn't see thousands. We didn't see hundreds of thousands over there. So the majority of the Israeli Arabs are people who are seeking to live in peace and security side by side with their Jewish friends and Jewish neighbors. I think that the ceasefire right now almost gave the opportunity for such kind of forgiveness, how to rebuild the coexistence, which used to be so strong between the Israeli Arabs and the Jews. I think that there are some Israeli Arab leaders start moving around 
in the joint cities inside Israel, calling for how to calm the situation, how to be quiet, and how to create a kind of forgiveness between the Jewish people and the Israeli Arab. It's, it is something broken here, something broken here. And this broken issue is not going to be repaired, not in one day and even not in one year. All of us, Israelis, Jewish, Muslims, Israeli Arabs should have to wake up and should have to start looking to the future of our children. I don't think that violence, from violence, we will never achieve anything. I think that the Israeli Arabs knows very well that their lives under the Israelis much better than it is under any other Arab country around the world. They knows that very well. And I hope that they will realize that without violence, we can only achieve more and more prosperity. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I want you to address the issue of uh, media, uh, yeah. the media coverage, both from uh, Europe. This is a question both by uh, Rob Goldberg, the head of our federation, and also a few people that ask uh, beforehand. Um, First, let's divide it for three different sections. The one, the US media, the European media, and then the media comes out of uh, Gaza itself. Uh, how do you see it, you know, media versus reality in each one of those uh, places? See, uh, Gan, I used to say all the time that media almost lost the ethics of journalism. There is no ethics of journalism in the media. There are a political agenda for the media, and each media has its own political agenda here. I'm not making different here between the American media and the European media, and even in the Gaza, in the Gaza media. You know, in Gaza, the media is very restricted, and Hamas controlling each word that you are going to put out or you are going to print out. Uh, so there is no free media in, uh, in uh, Gaza and let us exclude, exclude the media in the Gaza Strip. Let us talk about the American and the European, which they are claiming all the time that they are a free media. Unfortunately, the media today separated to do two different parts. The first part called a pro-Israel media, the second part called pro-Palestinian media. And by be being a pro-Israel or a pro-Palestinian, that's losing the trust of the media. I will never ever trust the media because looks like for the media, when you are pro, you have to hate the other side. That's the major problem here. And by being pro, you will never be able to bring peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. So I, I'm not quite sure that people these days trusting media. And I think that people much more today following the social media rather than following the original media. And so, um, thank you. So. so when it comes to the Gaza Strip, the journalists, reporters that were inside the Strip, whether they're Western or they're Al Jazeera, uh, did they have uh, freedom of speech when they were reporting during this uh, escalation round? No, of course they don't have. Of course they don't have. There is also a kind of an official censorship over there in the, in the Gaza Strip. And I think that the Hamas uh, police and the intelligence all the time warning the journalists, don't try to put out things without to check them with us. Means with us, when the rockets of the Hamas falling inside the Gaza Strip 
and killed Palestinians, the Hamas claim that those Palestinians killed by the Israelis. And the media inside Gaza also claim that those Palestinians killed by the Israelis. From the 400, the 4,300 rockets that Hamas shot towards Israel, around 500 rockets falling inside Gaza. By falling, 500 rockets falling inside Gaza, I am 100% sure that some people killed, some houses has been demolished. And this is how the Hamas should have to make their own accountability. But the media couldn't ever report about is such kind of things, because if they will report about that, then Hamas immediately will kick them out. I guess it also affects the number of images coming out uh, of, you know, those usage of um, shooting from uh, facilities like schools and hospitals or from residential neighborhoods. I know there's been issues uh, advertising them and live during the, you know, whenever there's a war, uh, Western journalists are actually afraid uh, to post those type of pictures uh, while they are inside of Gaza. And I guess this is also, you know, a little more appreciation to you as a Palestinian that's um, speaking up against Hamas and against the Palestinian Authority. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I think everyone else viewing you here uh, share this appreciation. And so I'd like to um, move to a similar different topic. Um, you yeah. are, as I said, a Palestinian that speaks up against Hamas, against the PA. Uh, I wouldn't uh, go and call you pro, pro-Israeli. Uh, right. Just, you know, I'm not that type of, I don't like terminology so much, but uh, I don't know, like you, there's like many um, Jews, especially abroad, like here in America, that criticize Israel. And I'm sure you've met many of them during your career, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, and other, uh, like, if not now, and other, those, uh, I want to say, extreme liberals, but, you know, terminology again. What is your yeah. opinion about that growing criticism by uh, Jews towards Israel? See, I think that those group, a little bit exaggerating in their criticism, those groups, their criticism much more based on the media and the TVs rather than on the facts on the ground. And I use, you know, sometimes, especially the Jewish Voice for Peace. I remember when I used, you know, to travel to the United States and to lecture in the campuses, those Jewish Voice for Peace group used to demonstrate against me. Why you want to demonstrate against me? Am I not allowed to speak? I am the Palestinian. I am the first one who has the right to speak on behalf of the Palestinians rather than you are. Whom you are. You can speak on behalf of Israel. You are Jewish. You are not Palestinians. But those people don't want the fact on the ground to be shown out. They want to hide all of those facts that I used to speak about them. I think that you can criticize, but don't in the meantime, it trying to use a political agenda when you are criticizing. The question is what the Jewish voice for peace really want to approach here? What are the goals of the Jewish a, 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 a voice for peace. What are the aims of the Jewish voice for peace? This is a very interesting issue. Why the Jewish voice of peace not allowing Palestinians to speak and to represent themselves? Why? You want to represent me? Never ever. You couldn't. I can speak. I am living there. I know exactly what is going on. Now, some leftist people, in the meantime, they have their political agenda also. Look to the leftists in Israel as an example. These leftist people, what really they did to the Palestinians? What really they did to the Palestinians? 24 hours, 
they are talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, criticizing Israel. But did the Palestinian really benefit from those leftist people? No, we never ever. So I, I think that there are some groups who are trying to gain money rather than anything else. I think that these people are much more looking to the fundraising and to the donors, how much money you are going to give us. I used to say that those groups who are criticizing Israel, these people used to be jobless and they found jobs forever. Like the BDS, like the Jewish Voice for Peace, like the Students for Justice for Palestine, all of these people used to be jobless and at least they found a job forever. So, oh, Basen, thank you for that. And let me try to uh, tackle you with the same question towards you. Um, as you know, I'm pretty active uh, on social media when, you know, you know, there's a big escalation around them. Right. My knowledge to try to, you know, and sometimes, sometimes I'm sharing your videos as well. Right. Uh, and then this is the exact same response I'm getting. And, oh, he's getting paid. He's saying whatever he needs. To oh, yeah, pay. yeah, yeah. A, 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 a self-sold uh, or I don't know what they, what they are calling it. Yeah, of course, of course. These people don't want to see us. These people don't want to hear the facts on the ground. These people trying to hide the facts and bringing their own political agenda in terms to achieve power and money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I usually just tell people, if anyone tells me or anyone else, so no, they're just getting paid to say what they're saying. It's like, okay, don't judge the book by its cover. Try to combat what the person is saying versus just telling me that they're getting paid. And, you know, that's why you don't have to uh, keep the debate. Um, but in the meantime, gun, in the meantime, they also get paid. They are not volunteers. They are not volunteers. Excuse me. They also get paid, so it's much better for them just to shut their mouths. Sorry for that word. No, no, that's uh, I understand and I. This agree. is what they deserve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, how do you think, as a Palestinian as well, but how is Israel being perceived in the eyes of? three groups of people. First, Israeli Arabs or Israeli Palestinians. Second is Israel Palestinians in the West Bank. And third, Palestinians in Gaza. How is Israel perceived by the people, the public, you know, more than just we see in the media? It probably the worst picture of Israel is existing in the Gaza Strip. In the West Bank, it's still different. In the Israel, among the Israeli Arabs, it's different. Don't forget, Gan, that in the West Bank today, we have around over than 150,000 Palestinian workers who are crossing daily the West Bank borders, entering to inside Israel to work. So these people, I believe, that they want to be quiet, they want to keep their jobs, they want a better future for their children. Now, towards the Israeli Arabs, I told you that the level of life that the Israeli Arabs got in Israel is much better than any other Palestinian living under any other Arab country in the world. Now, towards Gaza, Things are completely different. But in the meantime, in the meantime, when I talk just a few months ago with the group of Gazan yachts inside Gaza, you know what they told me? They told me, Basim, listen, if Israel tomorrow will open one of its borders for two hours only, 30% of the Gazan youths will immigrate to another country. So these people waiting for the opportunity 
to escape from the Gaza Strip. I assure you, I am talking with people a lot. You know, during this escalation last week, I talked with some people in Gaza and they asked them, what you are, what do you want from Israel? You know what he said? He said, we want Israel to continue hitting until a change will come. Then I said, do you believe that Israel will bring a change? What about yourself? Yourself who should have to bring the change. What about making a Gazan a spring, you know, related to the Arab spring? You know what was the answer? If the Iranian spring succeed, the Gazan spring will succeed. So these people knows exactly that they are closed, that they are under the pressure of a dictatorship which called Hamas. And these people are just waiting, waiting for opportunity just to escape from the Gaza Strip. This is the whole story of the Gaza Strip right now. Thank you. Um, we are almost approaching the last 10 minutes and I only have about 200 more questions. So I, will, <laughs> I have to pick and choose. Um, uh, here's a, something that you will need probably about an hour to answer and I will give you two minutes. Um, yeah. And I'm sorry for pronouncing some of the names. I just don't pronounce them right. Like Rage is from uh, Buffalo. I hope I pronounce your name right. And um, some congressmen like uh, Cortez, uh, AOC, and others uh, refer to Israel as an apart apartheid state. Uh, in your opinion, uh, does Israeli policy resemble at any, you know, anywhere like uh, South Africa apartheid? How does it resemble? How does it differ from it? Two minutes. Yeah, gun. I visited South Africa four times. And I was at the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg over there. I saw a lot of videos. I saw a lot of pictures. I saw a lot of things. I read books about the Apartheid. Israel is not the same. At all not. Now, by using the word apartheid against Israel, will that really benefit the Palestinians? In which way it's benefiting us? By considering Israel as apartheid, will that bring jobs to the Palestinians? Will that bring food to the Palestinians? It just became a slogan for those who want just to criticize Israel so they are considering Israel as an apartheid. But that's never ever profit the Palestinians at all. Thank you. Here's a question I would like to take and you can agree or disagree with me. Joseph Berg, uh, Bergen uh, will ask, was Israel's use of force out of proportion to Hamas's use of force given the death and damage told on each side basically saying was israel using excessive force given that there are 200 uh, death in gaza versus uh, 10 in israel and all the damage my answer to you joseph is yes israel use of force was very proportional uh, the use of force does is not considered by the death toll it's about the actions that is being taken to prevent civilian casualties uh, it's about the fact that Israel always warns uh, the people before uh, targeting them. Uh, phone calls, leaflets are being spread out around, sometimes yeah. even warning shots. And yeah. Hamas, on the other hand, is using um, civilian facilities to uh, shoot their rockets. And this is why Israel retaliates. And hence are um, the higher death toll in Gaza versus the one in Israel. And do you have anything to add to that, uh, Bassem? Yes. I want to tell Joseph that Israel is using its rockets to protect their own people. And the Hamas using their people to protect their rockets. This is unfortunately why we have more killed people in Gaza rather than Israel, because those people almost has been used as a human shield for the Hamas leaders and the Hamas rockets.
how popular is Hamas in the in Gaza and in the West Bank? See, in the West Bank, it's a little bit difficult for them to be popular because the Israelis' existence in the West Bank impose a huge limitation on the Hamas activities in the West Bank. Of course, in Gaza, they already created their own Islamic emirate over there, and they are looking to Gaza as their own country. But in the West Bank, I guarantee to you that Hamas has no kind of activities, and neither the Israelis nor the Palestinian Authority will allow Hamas to practice any kind of activities in the West Bank. Thank you. A few more questions before we hit the hour mark. And Mara, uh, our, uh, Mara, our uh, JCRC director, is asking about, if you can comment about uh, initiatives in Israel and the West Bank that brings people together, such as uh, Roots, uh, Shorashim, if you know Rabbi Schlesinger, yes. and also yes. Yad Beyad and Beyachad, uh, Right. Standing together, what, what can you comment about those initiatives? See, I, I, I really appreciate uh, those initiatives. I wish that we have more and more initiatives like that, because I am a person who believes that without a dialogue, without a dialogue, we couldn't reach any kind of peace. Dialogue is very important. People should have to come together. People should have to sit together. People must have to understand each other. By understanding each other, we are approaching more and more our goals and our aims. But while we are so separated, looks like that things became more and more hard for us. So I really appreciate these initiatives. You know, by the way, sometimes they are inviting me for such kind of joint meetings between Israelis and Palestinians. And I am always, whenever I have time, I like to appear over that, over there, and to educate the both sides how much is such kind of joint meetings are very important for our future and for our children's future. Thank you. Last six minutes. Uh, here's a controversial uh, topic, which I'd like to hear your thoughts. And you have yeah. two minutes for it. The settlements uh, in the West Bank and East, in East Jerusalem, we have Jennifer asking about it here. Um, Settlements as a whole, you know, Israel has been controlling the West Bank for over 50 years, but has not legally annexed it, while the settlements keep on growing, sometimes with connection or doesn't or not, it leads to Palestinians being forced out of their homes. Two minutes about that, please. Uh, see, by, by taking people out of their homes, I, I really didn't witness that at all, and I didn't hear that at all. If we want to talk about East Jerusalem, I must have to tell you that most of the houses which has been taken by the Jewish people, they have been sold to those Jewish people. I know it very well that most of these houses has been sold. Now, towards settlements, you know, during the past three weeks, all of Israel in the Palestinian media considered as a big settlement. Haifa is a settlement. Yafo is a settlement. The Israeli citizens in Tel Aviv are settlers. They are not Israelis, Israeli citizens. They are settlers. Now, if we will come to the real settlements in the West Bank, I must have to tell you that the, the settlements in the West Bank these days became a source of income to the Palestinians. I must have to tell you that we have over than 15,000 Palestinian workers working in the Israeli settlements in the West Bank. I must have to tell you that the one who is building the houses in the settlements are Palestinians. They are not Turkish, they are not Filipino, they are not Thai people. They are Palestinians. 
And right now, people never ever, the Palestinian workers never ever feel shame to say that I am working and building houses in each settlement, as an example, because people much more care about the future of their children and people must have to find a job in term to guarantee the future of their children. I just got an oak, a thumbs up uh, to go past the one o'clock. We're gonna go until 1.05. Uh, those who can stay with us uh, would, you know, welcome to. If you can't, you can watch the rest on the recording. Uh, so that gives me a little more, a few more minutes to address one, two important issues, maybe only one of them I can actually get to. Yeah. Um, the boycott movement, the BDS, I know you have like full lecture series about it. Can you uh, give your share about the boycott movement in a few minutes? You know, the boycott movement, also another group which is using the Palestinians for their own political agenda. We, the Palestinians, never ever benefited from the BDS. While the BDS succeed to close a factory in one of the settlements, they never ever succeed to find alternative jobs to those workers who has already lost their jobs in the settlements. So what we are benefiting from the BDS? The BDS is raising funds of millions of dollars around the world. Unfortunately, there are parliaments in Europe that they are supporting the BDS. I used to say, what is the budget of the BDS? Let us take the budget of the BDS and start investing it in the West Bank by building factories and by creating jobs to the Palestinians. It's much better than to spend it on the BDS and calling to boycott Israel. Since the BDS established in 2002, by the way, in Durban in South Africa, I didn't see that we, the Palestinians, really benefited from these people, at all not. They are just using us, and this is why I am standing against the BDS, because I don't want the BDS or other groups to use my own people for their own political interests here. All right, thank you. Here's another big topic. Uh, you probably won't be surprised. Uh, so some people don't know, uh, in 1948, sorry, yeah, 1948, uh, many Palestinians lost their homes in the Israel war, war of Independence. And for some of them, there will not be any long lasting peace without their uh, right of return right to return to uh, places which are nowadays Israeli cities and towns, and uh, I think it's very unfeasible. But still, if you talk about the BDS, one of their main uh, demands are to the right of return for Palestinians, about 7 million of them now. What is your take on that two minutes? <laughs> First of all, I don't believe that the BDS want the Palestinian refugees to return to their homes. First, second thing, I don't believe that the BDS achieve anything of peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis. I think that the main agenda of the BDS is how to destroy Israel, not to bring peace between Palestinians and the Israelis. So the BDS is a big fake news, which I don't believe would be in these people at all. Secondly, I don't believe that there is one Palestinian refugee believes, still believes that he will return to his house inside Israel. I don't think. I visited the refugee camps in Lebanon. I visited the refugee camps in Syria and I visited the refugee camps in Jordan. No one Palestinian believes that he will return one day to his house. You know, we are talking about 73 years. Those people who are holding the keys of their houses, I already told them that the Israelis almost changed those keys to remote control. 
They open the door by remote control. So you can go and trash the key that you are holding because that door is not exist anymore. I think that the only solution for the Palestinian refugees is either to give them a compensation and to recognize them as citizens where they are living right now, or to give them compensation and to ask them that they are most welcome to the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. Israel is out of the picture here. And I don't think that the world should have to push more and more towards the slogan, which I called it the right of return. There is no right, there is a return, but there is no right for that return. Thank you. And you are saying it as a Palestinian refugee. Right. Can use right. A quote. Okay, quickly, two last questions. Again, very long, uh, the, you know, something you'll need hours to answer, but right on two last sentences, what is your vision to end uh, this conflict or what does the future hold? Unfortunately, I am a very pessimistic person in nature. I call this Israeli-Palestinian conflict unsolvable conflict. And I used to say that it probably we, the Palestinians, need two or three generations in terms to reach peace with the Israelis. With the current Palestinian, corrupt Palestinian leadership, I didn't see that there is any peace future between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And last but not least, are right. you, I mean, um, my apologies for all the other questions in the chat that just don't have time to address. So I will try to uh, find a way to get it to you. Are you not afraid, Bassem? You are a Palestinian living in East Jerusalem, speaking up yeah. here in the world, social media. Are you not afraid to get hurt? You know, I used to ask people who are asking me about my security if they are running any insurance company here. I am uh, feeling, as I told you, that my arrest in 96 by Yasser Arafat almost gave me the impunity, the impunity. impunity. I am almost well known internationally. I already received a lot of international prices around the world. And the Palestine, I don't think that the Palestinian Authority need a new trouble on their heads right now if they will arrest me or if they will harass me. So I am feeling so secure. I am very happy with my neighborhood. I am very happy with my friends. And I will continue telling the truth wherever I will appear. Listen, Bassem, this is really admiring, you know, um, I don't know if I would be so brave if I was in your shoes. And as I told you, I have a very good friend in Gaza. His name is Rami. And he spent a few uh, months in the Hamas prison. He was just released a few months ago. Yeah. Again, I don't know if I would be so brave and a really hat tip to you for right. everything. And thank you uh, for reaching out and thank you for being here. And I was really amazed by the number of people we got. Um, I know many people, including myself, need to move on about their days. So I will really just tell you again, Toda, Shukran, thank you very much. Toda Raba, again, thank you so much. I really learned a lot from all of these questions that you presented to me. And I really hope that one day we will see in the light a kind of peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Thank you very much and all the best and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. And I will be providing more of this content in the future. So keep following. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. All the best to everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.